Welcome to a Sweet Saver Bible School. Thank you for watching. My name is James Reinars, and this is a clip from a Zoom class I taught recently on the history of Christian hymns, with a focus on singing devotionally. There were several parts to the class, but these clips are just of the lecture portion. More information can be found in the description. And that'll get to kind of, you know, if there's one kind of takeaway from this class, you know, when we look at her life, there's really no surprise that what she wrote was uh, precious, simple, but profound and affecting a lot of people because she had such a life in the word and we'll see a life ministering to people. And uh, in that sense, there, there's no surprises. There's no secret. She spent her days outpoured on the, on the word and outpoured on people. And that gives her words just a rich uh, foundation of experience and insight uh, that she could very simply say words that help us in our consecration to the Lord. A little bit about her personal life and her career. Uh, she never married. Uh, concerning This is a, a quote, I believe, from her sister. Concerning her personal life, she did have proposals of marriage, but she declined them. The one man whom she loved deeply did not share her faith in Christ. So she obeyed her king by not marrying an unbeliever. Though very deeply hurting, she, with, with clear thanks, called this God's withholding. She also had chronic health problems. I never saw a source really try to detail, um, but she would say that very often she was laid aside. You know, that, may, that phrase may have a certain kind of meaning to us now, but at that time that meant, you know, with some sickness, she just couldn't come out the house or for, for long periods of times. And this is a quote of hers. I have learned a real sympathy with others walking in darkness. And sometimes it has seemed to help me to help them. And if you remember the quote we had at the very beginning, she just commented, it seems that trials must be keenly felt if uh, they are to really be a, be a medicine from the healer or something that can then be a medicine to other people. So she had just chronic uh, frustrations, limitations, and, and, and things to deal with. And this is a quote said about her at the end. Never did a poet more truly learn in suffering what she taught in song. This is a... Uh, I think easily in her lifetime and still her most well-known hymn, uh, Take My Life and Let It Be. You know, she had, there's a really neat story around this that, that came about. And this is, again, written late in her life. So she has, uh, you know, if you read some things about her, she's really come through many kind of spiritual experiences to find a more of a kind of a breakthrough in her inner, inner experience. She, she would, along with the physical suffering, she would write a lot about longing to really know the Lord in a deeper way, feeling uh, even some you know, dark periods spiritually, and uh, you know, wondering how other people have such a free and full time with the Lord, and she has to pray earnestly for it day and night for so long. And eventually, she had a real kind of sp deeper spiritual awakening. Some would call it a, a second crisis or a breakthrough into an overcoming life of that kind of thing, a very similar description. And uh, in that season of her life, late in her life, she took a visit to the countryside and had this, this experience. Perhaps you will be interested to know the origin of that consecration hymn, Take My Life. I went for a little visit of five days to Arley House. There were 10 persons in the house, some unconverted and long prayed for, some converted but not rejoicing Christians. He gave me the prayer, Lord, give me all in this house. And he just did. Before I left the house, everyone had got the last night of my visit after I had retired, the governess asked me to go to the two daughters. They were crying. Then and there, both of them trusted and rejoiced. It was nearly midnight. I was too happy to sleep and passed most of the night in praise and renewal of my own consecration. And these little couplets formed themselves and chimed in my heart one after another till they finished with ever, only, all for thee. So you can see this hymn came out of a real... Um, kind of visits, maybe to friends or family, you know, that could just pass in any kind of normal way, right? But she said, there's 10 people in here. I want all 10 of them to be refreshed or to meet Christ for the first time. I want each of them to find you. And she prayed about it and gave herself in that visit that she could be a blessing to all 10. And the Lord really worked through her. And out of that, this, uh, this special hymn came. Again, her father wrote a tune for it. So I'd like to sing this too, because I think, again, you can see one characteristic with these tunes, not just of her father, but of that time, is very simple rhythm and very uh, easy lines to sing, right? 
um, take my life and let it be. My days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. It's a nice tune, right? Really a strong, joyful tune. But I think we could see how, again, this kind of other tune has become latched to it. The history of this tune uh, is that it got paired in America. Again, this is not an American hymn, but uh, Lowell Mason, who we'll learn about, he, he was a, not a writer, but a, a hymn organizer, hymn editor, hymnal editor, uh, brought a lot of American tunes to these great European words, um, paired it in his first publication with this tune, which has kind of always been married to now in America, at least. Take my life and let it be. And it's just a good tune, but we'll, but we'll learn it, right? Well, that's the end of our section. You can learn more about a Sweet Saber Bible School on our website, link in the description. There you can find course descriptions and find out how you can join the next class. And for now, I'll say thank you. Thank you so much for watching. May Jesus bless you, and may we become a saver that is pleasing to our God.